they often hit the most vulnerable the earliest. So where we're at right now is, uh, I don't know if you guys have been tracking the teacher pay raise conversation and kind of where that is. So we did a $3,000 teacher pay raise last year. The governor's attempting to do another teacher pay raise this year. The question is, how do you pay for it? And that's part of the struggle right now is that we're not where we thought we would be in terms of revenue collection from the state's perspective. And at the same time, we're trying to make sure that teacher teachers are compensated well. So there's a lot of conversation right now between the legislature, who is actually seeking a tax cut uh, for uh, what is really the top income tax bracket, and then the governor who's seeking, seeking a pay raise. And these two things are very difficult to reconcile, but they will likely be reconciled very soon because the legislature is running out of time to get that done. There's going to be a lot happening on Monday in terms of appropriations committee meetings and some of those conversations. The good news from our perspective is while $300 million was uh, the, the first budget proposal, from the governor, a lot of those cuts were put back in by the legislature. So the legislature put $30 million back in, trying to defend some of the critical programs that are out there. There was a good bit of pushback from legislators in rural Georgia, because rural Georgians would get impacted quite a bit by some of those cuts. So does that make sense? I was trying to kind of give you a big picture of where we are right now. And, you know, kind of thinking through what does that mean for us, as common citizens, is we do need to be engaged. Uh, we do need to be talking to our elected officials and letting them know that, you know, if you have concerns about the direction the budget is going, if you have particular concerns, they're there for you. They, they work for us, and you know, we certainly feel free to give them a call. But uh, I wanted you to know that whether it's this year, this governor, this legislature, there's some work that we need to do as a state to address, address some of the structural inefficiencies, so to speak, that are built into the tax code. Um, for example, when we try to attract a business or an industry to Georgia, sometimes we don't go back and take a look and see if those tax credits are still needed or if they're still doing the things that we hoped they would do to draw in jobs from the beginning. And so there's been a lot of conversations on both sides of the aisle about what kind of revisiting we need to do to make sure so, for example, if we brought in a business from out of state, we gave a lot of tax credits to get them here and to get that business up and running. If the business is up and running, then those cuts probably, those tax credits probably fulfill their purpose, and we may not need to continue that going forward. So, these are just some of the basic things that we all have to do as a household, right? To keep the lights on and do everything else. But we're encouraging those kinds of best practices for the legislature. Um, I've got a lot of other things I could talk to you about, I just wanted to give you some top-level things. Uh, a critical date that is coming next Friday is so-called crossover day in the state legislature. It is the time when if any legislation is going to live or die, it needs to make it from one chamber into the other chamber. So we're going to see a lot of activity this coming week. Try, you, you'll have legislators trying to keep their bill alive by getting it passed out of the House or passed out of the Senate. So there's a lot of things coming um, that we need to be paying attention to. But you guys are okay. I'm going to leave it here. And just, um, you know, any questions that you may have, again, I encourage you to email me. Um, and this is what we do all year round. We watch the budget. We talk about the budget. Uh, we watch how federal funds coming in are being spent. Our mission as an organization is try to build a Georgia economy that works for everybody. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but our main tool for trying to accomplish that is through a policy change and a reasonable budget conversation that lets people know what's going on. Also, really looking at what policies do and are they effectuating the change that we want to see in the real world. So, a little bit, but I'm here for any questions you have. Yes, and if it's okay, I'm going to kind of repeat the question a little louder so everybody can hear. So the question is, if you cut fund 
funding to uh, a department like the Department of Behavioral Health, don't we just shift those struggles or difficulties to somebody else like the local police department? The answer is yes. People who are hurting need help. And if they're not getting help in some uh, facet or capacity, they're going to need to be helped somewhere else. Um, we prefer to make sure that funding is in place to do that proactively rather than reactively. And uh, I think, unfortunately, we've seen as a, as a nation a lot of the struggles that we should be meeting head on with courage have gotten pushed into the criminal justice system. And that's, that could easily happen again in this instance. And in fact, in many cases, it's becoming the de facto institution to support people who struggle with addiction or to support people who are struggling with criminal health. And that is a very strong argument, and that is one that we make, is to either support people who are hurting on the front end proactively, or someone somewhere will end up doing it reactively with less effective outcomes. So it is a, it is a huge issue, and unfortunately these are some of the first programs that we've targeted in many cases. Yes? So I was
So these are the these are the efforts. And, and to be honest with you, this is a long game. This, this you know, long after I've passed away, hopefully my nine year old will be carrying on this work in whatever capacity can. We're still going to be having this.
historically existed in the state, or are we actively seeking to address those for the policy choices that we make? So hopefully that gives you more philosophical um, The budget cuts that are on the table with regards to social service programs will disparately impact people of color. Pure and simple. So um, that's a conversation we have day in and day out, trying to contextualize it again in the history of the Deep South and the state of Georgia in particular. Um, sometimes we persuade, sometimes we don't. It depends on the time of day, who the person is, and, and so on. Um, but we, as we seek to break away from the past and have a better future, all of us together, more equitable future, it can be challenging, to be honest with you. With regards to transportation in particular, it's hard to have a job if you can't get to the job. And so this is a huge uh, conversation. Uh, everybody got something cut from them. And what ends it? Not everybody. A lot of vulnerable people and the programs that serve them got something cut. So if you go through the budget proposal, which is about 375 pages. We'll see a million here, 50,000 there. Let's just go on down the list. So it was a lot of stuff that was trimmed out and some of it was put back, but in, in the majority um, was still kept out. The reason I wanted to talk about the structural inequities and the structural inefficiencies of the budget is this stuff is fixable. So I think that's a conversation we always need to have. I know if we've all had old cars in our lives, right? If they're not working, you think we need a tune-up. We need a we need a tune-up, to be quite honest with you. So a lot of the things that are being cut don't necessarily need to be cut. If we can close some of the loopholes, like I was talking about, you know, we bring industries in and then we don't turn around and sort of ask the question, are those tax cuts still getting us what we were supposed to get? You know, did the jobs come in? If the jobs came in, then great. Okay, you don't believe really that anymore. Um, we're currently looking at some other revenue options. Uh, there was the marketplace facilitators conversation and what that had to do was doing a better job of taxing things that take place on the internet. Because right now there's a lot of goods and services that move there. And honestly, that's a lot of revenue capture that's not taking place in the state of Georgia. So uh, we find ourselves in this weird position sometimes of trying to play, needing to play the long game to say we need to restructure this whole thing so that it works more efficiently while at the same time we have to play defense on the day-to-day -day programs that serve the day-to-day -day needs of real people. And it's, it's hard to have that conversation at the same time because in the electoral cycle, some people are just thinking about the next election or whatever. We really want to think about our grandkids and our great-grandkids. You know, how are they going to do in a generation from now? If we ain't where we want to be, how do we get there? And that's what we're trying to do. Hope the video is going to we have time for a few more questions. Uh, I, 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 I see that um, the education component, the higher education component, uh, took the vast majority of the budget. Has it, is there going to be any balance in identifying uh, behavioral health at an early age within within that environment where those money, where those dollars will be shifted to behavioral health? Because oftentimes, behavioral health
concerns about the 504 voucher runway, which we'll talk about later, <laughs> that it may siphon off from all the funds and siphon those into private schools. So that's something we got to watch. Um, but the good thing about the, the better reporting of children who may be struggling at an early age with the and I'm very sensitive to this because my son is on the autism spectrum. So the good news is we're identifying those kids earlier, and if that's taking place, then it at least helps us make the argument of the state legislature that we need to be funding programs at full capacity. So that what is it, Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken people. So this is an FY situation where that front end investment will pay off later. Thank you. Uh, in keeping with this theme that we've been on with regards to the budget cuts, I'm curious, and I didn't see it in the packet, whether you all calculate the or forecast the potential costs that are created by those budget cuts and who would bear those costs. So if it would be borne by the local government, if it would be borne by families, um, whoever it might be, is that something that you all are in the habit of calculating in order to more effectively communicate what the impact would be um, on us as citizens with regards to these cuts? It is something we do calculate as part of the arguments that we make. I'll give you an example. Let me add something that um, sometimes we're in the unfortunate space that there's simply not data available. So there's a lot of questions that we ask of the universe, and if there's no data to speak back to it, we either have to create the data ourselves or we're not able to answer the question. So as a general norm, we always try to do a cost-benefit analysis, and then to the extent that there is a cost, we try to answer the question, who's going to bear that cost? One of the examples I want to give you is a very big one, and it's about Medicaid expansion. And with regards to the waivers that were submitted late last year, uh, the, the Medicaid waivers are probably going to expand Medicaid to about 50,000 additional people in the state. However, if we did full expansion, we could expand it to approximately 500,000 people in the state at a cheaper cost to the state government than it would have been because of drawing down 67% of the federal match versus 90% of the federal match. Uh, we find that to be a terrible bargain. And if you look at the per person per month cost, it's, it's, you, you would never, sort of in comparison to shopping, buy that car versus the other car. So to the extent that rural hospitals are closing because of lack of Medicaid expansion, to the extent that people are dying because of chronic health difficulties because they can't see a doctor, those costs are no and they're calculable, and you can identify which local governments are going to bear them. And these are things that we mention on an ongoing basis in a number of areas to the extent that we have data that we can deliver that will respond to the question. Thank you. 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 David is with Georgia Budget Policy Institute, and they are a think tank that we rely on in our caucus of information. So they're like uh, a group of people that we can go to who are going to dig down really, really deep in the budget and give us some accurate answers in terms of what kind of cuts are going to occur and, and where other particular problems on the government's budget or our budget in the Senate and the House can occur. There were some questions that came up about some actual cuts to the particular budget. This sheet is a sheet that we had in the General Assembly. We just passed the mid-year budget. Let me just kind of explain the budgeting process that we go through, my colleagues here. Uh, we are in a fiscal year in the state of Georgia, which means our budget is going to run through the end of June. So when we come back at the beginning of January, we take that mid-year budget we have to either spend additional money based on the revenues collected, or we have to go back and reduce it. Georgia, by law, we have to constitutionally balance our budget. We cannot deficit 
committee in the state of Georgia. So the budget that we just passed in the Senate, I think we all know this one. Is that correct? <laughs> I know I did. The budget that we just passed in the Senate was what we call the small budget. It's the mid-year adjustment to the current budget that we passed last year. Now, before we sign it out, we have to pass what we call a mid-budget that goes into effect for the next fiscal year, starting July 1. So I just want to give everybody kind of a, a feel for the process of budgeting at the state capitol. On this particular sheet, and you all may recall at the beginning of the year, the governor said he's going to slash 4% across the board and make a whole lot of other component cuts. Well, the House and the Senate got together and said, well, no, Governor, we're not going to make all those cuts. So what this sheet is, is it tells you what particular departments for the state that those cuts actually got restored. So between the House and the Senate and for readings, we were able to restore a lot of those budget cuts. Where do we get our savings? Uh, I'll make this available to anyone who want to come up and look at it, by the way. We didn't make enough copies for everyone here. But you can see there's a lot of cuts that made in the Department of Corrections. There's a lot of cuts made by not good positions that have been vacant. Um, there were a lot of the cuts made in, and no cuts was made in the Department of Education, by the way, but our QBE funding formula. But when you get on this list, you can see the various departments that was actually cut, and I think David's already given you a kind of overview and a good feel for what we experienced with this current budget. David, I know they're already looking at the big budget, and I know you're going to work with us on uh, identifying some of those areas of the big budget that we can improve as well. Before I introduce my colleagues, with your permission, uh, Senator Madison, I'd like to introduce David and Seth to everybody. There were the two guys, the two guys who come up there from the Secretary of State's office and just give us a brief kind of summary of that equipment we have that we're you guys are expecting in this upcoming election. We need to know whether or not we're going to have adequate machines to vote across Georgia. Uh, any of those other issues that are really important to everyone out here that has to vote. We need to know you're going to be ready for the midterm presidential as well as the primaries and game and of course the election of the Can you guys go? Please, please, sir. Uh, this is something wrong back there. I'm from Maryland, I went to high school. Uh, I went to Browns Mill as well for sixth grade. And I went to Bowie and Harrington Elementary. My mom lived in Black Boy High School. When it was black coming out. So, um, when we got back there for the Senator Ladies, she know is at the bottom of the clock. Ooh, only for her. So, we have the new voting machine was to be an all precinct across the state. They already wrote them out. We already started voting on early voting. Make sure you get to your precinct. Make sure you check your voting. EPP or SOS to make sure you're already situated, ready to go. Um, please, that I try to make sure you just have to get a feel for it. Um, and we'll see you soon. Um, so, yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Seth Daniels. Um, like Xavier said, if y'all have not had a chance to put your hands on and see the new voting machine up close, please do go back there. We have it now. Uh, the main difference is that this new machine has a printed paper ballot. And so when you go back there, it will look familiar to what we've been doing for the past 18 years. It's a touch screen. You get a card stick it in the touchscreen machine and then you vote on the touchscreen. But it will print a physical paper ballot. And the touchscreen itself is not actually counting the votes. That paper ballot is what is counting. You need to take it to the scanner and have that scan. The scanner will count it and then they drop it to a storage bin where they're stored until after the election. We can do a recount with the physical paper ballots if we need to. Uh, so so those are the two, that's the main difference. 
between what we then had and what we're having now. And this is live right now. We have all the machines rolled out. Right now, early voting is going on right now for the presidential preference primary. Uh, we will use these for the May primary, the July runoff, and the November election. We're probably going to have a runoff election in January, too, because the way things are going. So, uh, this is a new system that we've got going forward. Uh, there's about 33,000 of the ballot marking devices, and then about one scanner for every 10 of those across the state. Uh, every every machine has its own printer. Uh, if the printer runs out of paper, the touch screen will not work. And so there will be a warning that shows up. We've gotten that question a lot. It laughs what if it runs out of paper. It puts a warning on the screen. We can show you all that later. Uh, it won't go. Uh, so we, we feel very confident this system uh, gives the security of having a paper ballot, having a physical record of your vote, not of your vote, but of a vote. There is no personally identifying information uh, on there. Uh, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. Right. So why did you that? I can't hear you. So his question was, why did the city of Athens, why did Athens Clark County reject the machines? Uh, that is a decision that the Clark County Board of Elections decided to do. It was a three to two vote earlier this week. Uh, it's, that's not the end of the story. I mean, that, that will keep going. Our understanding is state law does not permit uh, the Athens Clark County Board of Elections to make that decision. Uh, so the, that's a that's a development. Yes, ma'am. So my question is, is it takes regular ink, correct? So when it when it populates a copy, if the ink is messed up, with the QRC be would that mess up the vote since it's on a uh, barcode? So what if the ink is missed, is skipping or something of that nature? Would it still read everything that I put? And even though the ink is skipping or, you know, a peak in a certain area, because if this is like standard HP 85, you know, ink, correct? Uh, so, you go back and look at the box, but it might be a, a laser printer or a or ink printer. Uh, my understanding is the, the printers uh, can do about 3,000 ballots per printer before they start running out of ink. Uh, and be honest, we've had these for a couple months. We haven't got to that point yet. But, I mean, uh, but that is an excellent question. So, not, so not so much out of ink, but if you go on and you bought a brand new ink, and yet you may have a splotch or something in your print that's not correct. So with that small pixel that's not picking up, would that then turn out my vote to something different? Would it make it skewed because the ink on just a drop? Has now turned or, or moved the line just enough? Sure. That, that is a great question that I don't have a uh, ready answer for. But I will say that the uh, so when you print that ballot, there is the barcode where that would be the decision. There is also the human readable portion, the English words on the page. And that is the ballot of record. And so after the election, we're going to start doing uh, an audit, a risk limiting audit, where we pull out ballots from the storage bin, we do a hand tally of those, we run them back through the scanner and make sure the scan count reflects that hand count, and if there's a discrepancy, we go off of the hand count. So, hopefully if there is some streaks, some marks, some missed ink or something like that, that the human readable, the English language part of it uh, will still be readable. Um, and if not, then it would go to a Kansas board to determine what the voters the barcode, the QR code, doesn't it give you an error message? Uh, the question, the question was, the question was, uh, if, the, if the scanner can read the barcode, would it give an error message? Uh, and, and yes, it, it very likely would. And uh, we would either put those in the uh, emergency bin account later. We put them aside, treat them as a provisional balance, and that they can count later, probably reviewed by a Kansas board. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, are you uh, introducing staff? We've got a lot of positions. Hey, how are you all? It's a 
Larry Johnson. And I was uh, in D.C. and we talked uh, to the folks in California, in Los Angeles County. They spent about $350 million just to go to the county. They spent that probably in the state. But they talked about the calibration and how sensitive the machine is in this bump and somebody touching, you know, the bump. So you would be open to me. You may press the button, but you may hold the person above it. Are you stressing with the counties? But you can't just bring the machine in and ask for a special case or above. You know, what about the calibration of these machines and how sensitive they are? Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, so Los Angeles County actually spent um, a lot of money. They developed their own uh, voting machine. They did not go through a traditional vendor. Uh, we went with Dominion Voting System, it's more of an established uh, company. But they wanted to go their own way as, their, as is their right prerogative and uh, come up with their own system. Uh, we have not experienced that with our machines. Um, so it is a different model, it's a different machine. Uh, we have done, this, this is Xavier's fourth demo this week, so we, we take these things on the road a lot. Um, and so far we have not encountered that issue. Uh, my understanding too is the Los Angeles County system that is more of a, uh, a unitary system where your touch screen, your printer, your scanner uh, are all part of the same console. Is that, is that correct? Uh, and we have three distinct functions. So if something goes wrong with the touch screen, we replace that. The printer, we replace that. Scanner, we replace that. I'm Senator Glory of the House. I was waiting because I had a late meeting. But I wanted to uh, address Commissioner Johnson's uh, question. When we had, I'm going back, we had the bill in committee. That was one of our concerns, that something could happen to the barcodes when it's going from one machine to the next machine. And just as someone mentioned that you did, Larry, and this little bump to the machine might make a big difference. So we had a lot of discussion about these machines before they were ever purchased. So I don't think that we, were the ones that made this happen because we did not. I was totally against the bill. I was totally against the company because we were we built a bill to match a company. And who does that? That is not the way it's supposed to be. When you write a bill and you choose a company, they're supposed to be able to provide to you what you need. You don't turn around and make a bill suit what they have. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> this, this thing. Final question. Is considering that it is a new system and we are at such a large population of voter turnout coming this time around in the election, are there any systems in place that the public can put their hands on?
fraternity, sororities. We had at least two churches every Sunday and have been for the past seven to eight weeks. Uh, we have a location set up in our poor drive location where if somebody wanted to come in and test drive the machine, they have an opportunity to do that. We advertise the location on our website in the county newspaper, so word is getting out and we are, we are busy. As a matter of fact, we were so busy we could not accommodate one of our senators who called us to be here tonight. So this is why the state is here. Wait, something. 
but not sufficiently less. That's the book you had on your face. Um, I guess that's how we're working now because they have been excellent uh, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Ooh, I don't know why you're so hot. <laughs> so I apologize for being late because, well, I was late because I had a committee hearing, had a bill in Senate Judiciary. This bill was, is a records restriction bill. Tanya Anderson. Records restriction bill, and I was actually at the bottom of the list, and they moved me up because I was only at a town hall. At any rate, this records restriction bill would um, seal the records of an individual who was arrested but not been convicted. So initially, when a person is arrested, it automatically goes in their record. They have not been at a, at a hearing, no, they have not been before a judge. And it automatically goes on your record. The state of Georgia is not surprisingly, but the worst for um, for for not um, clearing records for for, for records restriction. And so, what this bill does, it seals it from the public, um, but law enforcement and the judicial system have access to it until that person is goes before a judge. So the, the rule of thumb is innocent until proven guilty. And so in Georgia, when you're arrested, it was on your record. Out of 11 million Georgians, and it never comes off, it never comes off. Out of 11 million Georgians, 4.2 million have some type of record. That's a wow. Keeping people from jobs, housing, schools. I mean, going back to school. And so this will be, an, oh, we don't use the word expungement, but a restriction of your record. And a, if, it, if you've been, um, if it has been dismissed, it comes on. Um, I had a young lady testify in my hearing that said her father was 67 years old. He wanted to make a purchase. When the purchase a gun at a pawn shop, his record came up, something he did 40 years ago when he was in his 20s. So this bill comes um, in a much needed fashion for Georgia. So we'll see what happens. Um, I got a hearing. Hopefully we can make some amendments on the floor. There was another bill that they tried to attach to my bill, which was not my bill. But we're going to work on some amendments, try to get this passed. Um, and I'm going to continue to work on it until it gets passed. And it is an official law in the state of Georgia. So that's why I was made. So then I'm working on another bill. And this bill is called the Crown Act, which um, prevents discrimination for people wearing their natural hair. Whether it's locks, braids, and afro, um, they can't, it, this bill will prohibit discrimination of your black or job because it does not, your hairstyle does not prevent you from producing or doing your job professionally. Um, and it should not be discrimination against someone, again, for housing, for school or for employment. And what this bill does, it is started in California and it is catching away. It's gone from the West Coast to the East Coast. New York and New Jersey has passed the bill. We've introduced it in 24 other states, um, specifically in the South. What has happened is, and it's for public and private employers that they cannot discriminate. So what has happened, um, a lot of employers and organizations rely on the federal law. There is no state law. This will make the state law hold them accountable and prevent discrimination based on race 
and hair. So in the bill, I had to describe what race is, what discrimination means, texture of hair, hair um, protective style. So my cute little bun, ponytail piece, and come off with this protective style. So I'm going to burn my hair every day trying to do something to it. <laughs> so we'll, hopefully we'll get a hearing on that Monday. And then another bit that I introduced that I heard today that I will not get a hearing for. Senate Bill 283, which makes Election Day a state holiday. That there's really concern about people getting to the polls, um, then, you know, whatever needs to happen, um, it won't be restricted. People won't be restricted. So, um, in addition to the budget, and I know my colleagues have done a great job with that. Those are the bills that have been proposed. Additionally, um, I represent Indicab, Lithonia, and Stonecrest. There is a new training facility coming to um, George Piedmont. It's over there, um, right off of. It's Lithonia Industrial, but before you Lithonia Industrial, that's. Um, I'm trying to think of my, my Marble, the street. Marble Road that cross sections with um, it's not Main Street, it's still on the Pony Road. So I'm trying to think of it. It's still on the Road and Mark, right there. And we have your wonderful senators from the CAM have um, lobbied and successfully gained. $5.7 million for that facility. Yes. And $4 million. In addition to that, $4 million from your county commissioners. Yes. So we will have a 10, pretty much a $10 million facility for training, uh, technical training in um, DeKalb County. A new facility a brand new facility. Um, so that's pretty much my um, my updates. Question, ma'am? Um, I have a question about Senate Bill 463. It's an anti voting rights bill, and it was rushed through by the Senate Ethics Commission. So they're supposed to. When is, do you know what they're going to vote on that? So Senator Buck is on the Ethics Committee, and I'll let us speak to that. Uh, the bill is in rules right now. It hasn't come out for hell. But one of the things that's in that bill is um, splitting precincts, which I have a huge issue with that because when you split precincts, everybody don't get the notice that their precinct is somewhere else and they're going to show up at their usual precinct, not be able to vote. Um, and it, it's so hurtful because a lot of times people have to get rides somewhere. And if their ride go to run another errand, then they're stuck at the precinct. It's going to take them forever to get to vote. And sometimes they don't vote to go back home. And that's called voter suppression. We cannot have that. That bill is um, probably going to come to the floor next week. And we're supposed to have a couple of people working on some things in that bill to, to um, fix that. I don't know if it will get fixed, but we're supposed to be working on it. Um, the other thing in the bill that's concerning, and I didn't bring any notes about it, um,
um, this bill removes our responsibility of the state election boards to ensure counties uh, follow federal voting rights. They're going to push that onto the counties, which advocates their responsibility of making sure that um, the, the state election board uh, follow the vote, federal voting rights law. Another thing that it does. Once we are 
able to get whatever that kind of version is in the bill, then that kind of version will be discussed with the public. But right now, I cannot tell you what the final version of the bill will look like. And I'm glad to hear that, but I wish you would compromise because first, before you draft it, this rather draconian, maybe not all that, said the table. The way this has happened is difficult to us, and I do not like that.
because you have no more therapists, you have no more medication, you might have no more primary care. So folks, this impacts all of us in this room. So please, you all, 10 minutes, 10 questions. Got some giveaways we'll pass out back here. Commissioner Rita Davis Johnson has helped because she helped fund down the chair of the board for the complete count committee. Uh, we heard from, our, uh, from just a whole host of people, but we must make sure your civic duty is to fill this out. This is the only thing that's one of the things that required in our Constitution that was passed to fill out our census. So can I count on you all? Yes, you can. Can I count on you all? Yes, you can. Stone Chris, Mr. Mayor, we need 100% city, we need 100%. And so we're challenging our churches to be 100%, we're challenging our neighborhood. If you got an HOA, you all want your HOA to be 100% HOA. We've got churches now putting on their digital signs. So if you got a church, you belong to a church, you got a business, put this on their sign and remind people that we need to be, have everybody counted. And you see down here, the cap counts 2020.org. The cap counts 2020.org. Thank you, Senators, for allowing me to speak. Uh, your Senator Ty Anderson is on the complete, complete count committee. And so uh, just for your efforts and for what you all have done to help to move the ball, because they have not, at the federal level, they still have not hired the outreach workers. You know how people apply for the jobs? You make it $22 an hour. You get paid every week and you get benefits, but there has not been one person hired. So what the Cat County has had to do, we've had to extend our outreach team till June. And we're about to go on iHeart Radio. We're about to go on all radio stations that iHeart is in because we want to make sure as a county that everybody is counted. So we don't get anything right. I know we're about to get distracted because the elections are coming up. But please, you all, have these folks to them out. Because everything is dependent on your city. This is the city of Stonecrest. This is your first census officially. And you want to have to maximize the funds that are available to you. You talk about infant mortality. If only uh, you got 10,000 people who need the, the program on infant mortality, but only 1,000 people fill it out, guess how much money you're going to get? You're only going to get it for 1,000 people. But, but 9,000 people are not going to get it, but they're going to need the program. And guess what's going to happen? If they don't pay for the federal level, guess who pays for it? The county and the cities. And guess what? More kids are now dying that don't have to die because they didn't have prenatal services. And this prenatal program is not based on income because the rates in a higher income African American community is worse than the rates in Dunwoody. And we only about 10 minutes apart from each other, 15 minutes apart. That's a travesty in a country, a world-class health a country that has the best health care in the world. And you got people dying, young people, because we don't have the services. So thank you, Senator Butler, for bringing that up. Thank you. Yes, ma'am.
we do in our public meetings every single week to discuss legislation, which is open to the public, some of open to the press. The House does the same thing. They have meetings that is open to the public, open to the press. We discuss legislation that we introduce. And as it pertains to Senate Bill 469 or any other bill, there's always a conference committee, a reconciliation process between bills that we introduce in the Senate and bills that are introduced in the House. I have introduced this year about seven bills. Of those bills that I've introduced, they pertain to everything from the press to the Department of Education, the Department of Agriculture, and on and on and on. Those same bills that I've introduced are heard in the committee, which is a committee that's open to the public. That's the first step. Then that same bill goes to the Rules Committee and the Rules Committee. Then that same bill is then heard on the floor. And then the process starts all over again in the House of Representatives. So all along the way, for any bill that we introduce, general bill, local bill, it doesn't really matter. There's multiple avenues for constituents like yourself to weigh in on. So we don't break bills in the back. We don't pass bills in the back. We don't pass bills for ourselves. Anything that pertains to Stonecrest, it takes members of the delegation in the Senate. It takes all the members of the delegation in the House to pass that local legislation. So I hope you understand that the questions that you're asking What's the justification? We don't. We, we understand that there's a process that you go through. We want to know what is the justification for you making that decision for us. Why was this law so being considered in the first place? It's already in the charter. So I have a question. How many people were in the initial um, portion of meeting when the charter was being put together? Two, three, four. How many people are familiar with the legislation that was passed uh, by the Chamber of the House and the Senate two years ago? Change of the charge. One, two people. There, there's a man. Excuse me? Are you talking about the one where it's at the Senate meeting at the first? Are you talking about that one? No. I'm talking about all of the bills that's been submitted in the chamber, both the House and the Senate. That bill originated two years ago in the House. So those bills that were originated in the chamber, all the bills pertain to different cities, and there was bills that one bill that introduced in the same Sir, please address this man's question. My, my question was just, what's the justification? I'm sure that there's, I know that there's a process, I'm, I'm okay with that part, but what's the justification for you even submitting the bill in the first place? Yes, sir. Let, let me just tell you. Yes. As it pertains to Stonecrest, or any other city that I represent, if there's issues that's raised by any of the constituents regarding the functionality, the governance, the management, of any city or any municipality that we represent, when issues are brought to us by our constituents, we have to act on them. So you said, fact, uh, I believe that your mayor mentioned when he filed uh, the CPO that that issue was brought up by constituents. The mayor is representing his constituents no different than we represent ours. So you're saying that a constituent made a request to put this in? So we no, I'm not saying that constituent. I'm saying multiple constituents. So, so we can request that. We can figure out what, what uh, that, there, that there actually was. Like there's a process for us to figure out who made this request, that there actually was a request. I, I know with the city there's an open records request, so I can go through. You ask your question, I answer it. Okay. All right. Next. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that there have been members of the community who have spoken both to our state representatives as well as our city council members 
about some of the very changes that have been proposed in this charter change. So while there is opposition to it, it is not out of the blue. There have been people for two years since the creation of this city who have specifically asked for and advocated for specific changes that are in this. I did not personally have a conversation with any senator about it, but I know that the Stonecrest Citizens Coalition put forth a policy agenda a year and a half ago that we publicized that has a lot of these recommended changes within it. I've had conversations with council members. I know that council members have had conversations with other members of the public and have had conversations with our state representatives. I am making a statement just like other people have repeatedly made statements. So individuals who did not have the benefit of having created the charter and created the city now would like to have a say in how the city is structured going forward. So my question is what process would you recommend for the citizens to be able to have further input as this bill moves through the process? Thank you. Thank you for that question, by the way. Part of, uh, part of what you, citizens have to do is to do exactly what all of you do in this world. We're making the voices come. So we encourage that. As these bills make their way through the committee, certainly I would encourage you to follow these bills and track these bills. If you have any questions about anything that I've worked on, I always make myself available to constituents. I give you my number, 404-656-0502. 404-656-0502. That is my Senate office number. My Senate email is emmanuel.jones at senate.ga.gov. Emmanuel, E-M-A-N-U-E-L, by Jones, at senate.ga.gov. So there's multiple ways to reach out and make sure your voice is heard. I listen to everybody, and my job is to represent any city. My job is also to listen to the constituents that they have in Stonecrest because those constituents are our constituents. The reason why the three of us are here is because each one of us represents some portion of that city. That's what makes us the delegation members of the city of Stonecrest or any other city within our district. The same is true for the House of Representatives. There are six members in the House of Representatives that represent any part of Stonecrest. So the same process that you have in terms of reaching out and communicating with us, I would encourage you to use the same process to reach out and communicate and make sure your voice is heard with members of the House of Representatives as well. And if you need any assistance with finding out who the House members are that represent those areas, I think there's six of them, right? You know, Representative Doreen Carter. And I'm, I'm right here. He's okay. over here. Representative Vernon Jones, Representative Sean Kendridge, Representative Pam Stevens, Representative Karen Bennett, and I know I'm missing one, and Representative Viola Davis. Those are the six members in the House of Representatives, and the three of us in the Senate. Let me also add one thing. Uh, when we start local legislation, we require city council to send us a resolution saying they want us to open up their charter. So I have a resolution that was signed by four members of the city council to start the press that says we want the Senate to make the well, legislature, I hate to say the Senate, by the way, sorry, Representative Biden, we're going to have equal ability for the President of the Senate. Right, yes. We want the legislature to make those changes in the charter. So that resolution that they sent to us triggers a lot of what we do. Those city council members that represent Stone Press are a lot closer to all of the constituents in Stone Press than any of us are. That's why we have multiple levels of representative government. 
There's no resolution. There's a Captain Turner over there, and I'm over here. There's no resolution that we submit. I want to address I didn't know that. You know what Chris was in my district because no one ever came to talk to me about it. Excuse me? Maybe I didn't go. Because I did not go. As a rule, I don't focus. See, I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the creation of stone bread. Period. When it was first created, no one. No one came to talk to me about part of my district being in stone. No one. No, I, I can't. No one let somebody come talk to me. So, but you're No, it doesn't work that way. I don't go and seek out legislation to know about. We have thousands of bills from the House and the Senate. So I can't see every bill that comes by. So I, I was on the government commission, and we talked about the creation of the Stone Press for almost five years. That may be true. Before, before it passed. So you as our representative. That may be true. You as our representative. But that's not what I'm talking yeah. about. I as said no one talk. came and talked with we me. Don't have to. This is, you work for us. You work for us, so if we want to create a city, and you know about But I should be treated fairly, just like you want to be treated It doesn't behoove me. I have a you. Right. <coughs> so what you have to I don't know. Where do you live? I live in the Stone Press. But you may not live in my district. Oh, yes, you do. I do. At the time that I, I was elected, like, you, you probably did not go for me. I lived in my house for over 17 years. Did you go for me? I'm sure I did at least once. Does it matter? At least once. But my point is, I think you missed my point. No, I, you didn't let me make mine because you said you're right. All I'm saying to you is that as legislators, you're elected officials. It's the government who cool us to come to you and say this is what we want to do. You should be aware. It was in the newspaper. It was in the media. We, we are here to have. We, we are here to have a conversation. I shout back. All I'm saying is, all and, I'm saying is this. We heard you, no, you we heard you, you and when you, you have finished enough, and let me tell you, you're not here to help you. We are not here to help you. Let me tell you, you love you. Should hear so, I appreciate you coming back again here tonight. Our uh, uh, no, 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 no,